Hey everybody, welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. Today, we're gonna to be talking about backyard conservation with Caitlin Cunningham. Today is also a pronoun day, pronoun awareness day. So if you'd like, you can change your name uh, today and every day uh, to include your pronouns in your visible name. Uh, you should also be doing that on email signatures and on social media and other places so that uh, stating our pronouns becomes just a very normal, regular thing that we do to be inclusive of uh, folks who do not fit in the gender binary. Um, we're so glad that you're all here with us today and we are super pumped to talk about science happening right in our backyards. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Caitlin to introduce who she is, what she does, why she likes it, and then sharing a couple slides with us about her work. Hey everybody, I'm so really excited to be here today. So I am going to share my screen. Um, so just as I'm... Um, Okay, can you all see my screen now? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, cool. Um, so first I want you to think about what do you hear when you hear the word city? What, what kind of images come to your mind? Now, what about if you hear the word conservation? What sort of things do you start to think about? So you probably thought of really different things with cities being full of concrete and cars and space for people and conservation really being about filled with plants and animals. But cities are also full of biodiversity. There's lots of plants and animals in the city and a lot of them are really cool and sometimes unique. And we also need to start thinking about those. Uh, so we also start need, need to start thinking about cities um, as part of our conservation strategies. And there's a lot of different places that we can find nature throughout the city. Um, sometimes on the outskirts of cities, you might find places that'll look a little bit like what you probably thought of when you heard conservation. So I live in a city that is surrounded naturally by forests and lakes. So we have a lot of that on the outskirts of the city. And also inside of the cities, um, there's places where we put nature on purpose, like gardens. And then there's also the spaces that we don't always think about when we think of nature in the cities, like cemeteries or even our own front and backyards. So in my research, I think about all of these different places and how they can work together to better support nature throughout the cities. Um, and so my core research question is how do we better design cities to support nature? And a lot of what I think about in this space is how do all of these different spaces work together and how well connected are there? Are they? Um, so I work a lot of the times to measure what we call connectivity, which tells us how easy it is for animals to move across a landscape and access different pieces of their habitat. So you can kind of think about it as planning wildlife transit networks in cities. So just like how people will use transit to move around the city to get between where we live, work and play, animals also need to be able to move around um, to access where they find food, mates, and different habitat needs at different times of the year. Now, if we think about a city, there's oftentimes really large parks um, or pieces of um, natural woodland near the city. And those are usually what we start to think about um, when we think about connectivity, but we also need to think about how they're connected. And sometimes there are corridors of habitat that are left alone that connect these habitats, which is great, um, but that's pretty rare. Most of the time what's in between uh, these larger parks is residential neighborhoods, and a lot of the green space that's in between them are our own backyards and front lawns, which can be up to 80% of the green space in a, in a given city. So even though these spaces are small, they can add up really fast, especially if there's a lot of them. And it also kind of helps us in the city. And it also is what makes this research so interesting and so unique is that you have to talk to people and you have to figure out how they're going to use their space to get something that they like because it is your habitat, 
but also thinking about how we can share our habitat with other animals. Um, so that was just a really quick, uh, stop sharing. Um, so that was just a really quick introduction to what my research is. Um, and I'm currently working on that at Dalhousie University. That was a quick and quick version of what I'm doing. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so for everybody in our audience, if you have any questions about uh, what you just heard or, or just questions in general for Caitlin, please submit them um, down below in the Q&A. Uh, and so my first question is, um, so let's say you have never really gone out in your backyard looking for nature before. Maybe you've seen a bird or a squirrel here and there. Um, how do you get started looking for life right in your backyard? Yeah, um, really, you just got to kind of look for it. Um, and even if you live um, in a really dense city, there's always life around us. There's always bugs and little critters uh, to find. And it's what I really love about looking around the city is that it changes throughout the year. Um, so you'll see different animals in the spring and different animals in the fall. Um, so I've noticed with this pandemic, I've got my desk set up now where there's a willow tree outside. And in the winter, when we were first uh, starting to work at home, I was seeing cardinals. Then I got really excited because I saw a robin one day and the blue jays came in and now the blue jays are kind of starting to go away and we're getting starlings. Uh, so it's been really nice to watch. Awesome. Uh, our next question is, can we find animals in the desert? Yeah. Um, so I think we often think about deserts as these lifeless spaces. Um, that's really unfair to deserts. There's a lot of really cool animals, and I don't know a lot about them, uh, but deserts are really full of life. I know there's lots of really cool insects in deserts. If you go out at night and you happen to have a black light, um, be careful with black lights shining on your skin and uh, particularly your eyes. But uh, if you shine them in, the, if you're in a desert area, you'll find scorpions super easily because they basically glow green. And so I know when I was traveling through Texas and New Mexico and Arizona last fall. I mean, I brought my black light out every time I went out at night and they were everywhere. It was so easy to find them and they were really uh, super, super cool. And also uh, it made me feel better to be able to see the scorpions <laughs> so that I wouldn't accidentally step on one and one wouldn't startle me. Uh, Cause I'm, I have lived in Philadelphia and Connecticut and Boston in my life. So I uh, am not used to seeing scorpions. Uh, so that was really, really cool for me. Um, there's also a lot of lizards in the desert, and so I love lizards, so that's super exciting for me. Yeah, that's um, one thing that I miss about living in the Maritimes. Not yeah, a lot of lizards sure. here. Lizards. Uh, all right, the next question's from Gavin. Are lawnmowers a threat to animals in our backyard? Yeah, so they're a threat in quite a few different ways. Um, so one, if you're not, there's kind of the obvious, like the physical threat of if you're not careful, or if the animals may be sleeping or hibernating um, and you clip it, obviously that can hurt them. And we mow our lawns, it takes away a lot of habitat. So when we keep our lawns really short, um, there's not a lot of things that can use it uh, to hide or to find food. Um, so the longer we can let our lawns grow and the more weeds we can let in and the more flowering plants, uh, the more habitat they provide. Awesome. Um, so that sort of relates to our question from Ruby and Thomas. How can we encourage more wildlife in our backyard? So you've already suggested um, not mowing your lawn, uh, letting native plants grow. Is there anything else that we can do? Yeah. Um, so for anybody who's listening on the call, if you're in Canada, I highly recommend checking out the Canadian Wildlife Federation's um, Backyard Habitat Certification Program. And the National Wildlife Federation in the United States has a really similar program. And they give you lots of tips and tricks about um, how to promote local wildlife in your area. And usually there's three key things that you want to start to look for to provide. You wanna provide animals with a food source, a water source, and some kind of shelter. So that food can be things like maybe a plant that produces berries um, or a flowering plant that will have nectar for bees. And for water, sometimes, you know, you might be really lucky and you have a little pond in your backyard or you're on a stream, uh, but not all of us have that. I definitely don't. Um, so you can have a bird bath and, and you can provide water that way. 
and shelter, that can be a, look a lot of different ways. Um, so you can have little shrubs where birds can kind of hide out in that, um, which is what I have. Um, yeah, you could build a bird box if you really wanted to build one for yourself. Lots of different ways. Awesome. Um, Caitlin, your internet connection isn't super great. So I know that this is kind of a bummer, but do you think you might want to um, like turn off your video so that all the bandwidth can go to hearing you because your voice is breaking up a little bit? Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, I totally understand. Everybody's having a similar problem. All right, the next question is uh, Mark, grade six, wants to know how you track the movement of animals uh, through the terrain. Yeah, so some scientists will um, put trackers on their animals. Um, so sometimes you'll see it's like a collar around the animals um, or you can have a little tag on them. Um, but what I do is I look more at the landscapes and sort of do more predictive modeling. Um, so I use what's called circuit theory. So we borrow um, theory from electric current theory um, where we start to think about our landscapes as a resistance surface. So I kind of have to think about, um, say I'm looking at a fox, I kind of have to put on my fox goggles and think, okay, if I'm a fox, what's really easy for me to move through uh, what's a really easy landscape for me to move through? I like forests, um, so that's going to be really easy, a really low resistance. I'm okay moving through a golf course. I don't really want to, but I will. Um, so that'll be kind of a medium. And I don't like dense, dense parts of the city where there's lots of people, lots of houses. So that's going to be really high resistance. And then I'll try and move that a current through the landscape. So I'll start it on one side and have it go towards the other. And just like how electricity will move um, across a surface, we can make electricity move through this landscape. Um, so what we end up with are these maps that show us flows of currents and it'll show us areas where it's really easy to move, there's no problem, the animal can move in all kinds of different directions, but it will also show us the places where flow is a lot more constricted and it's going to have to move along this one um, really narrow place. And those are what's really interesting for conservation and what's really important um, because those are probably where we need to start looking for places um, to protect or maybe even to do a little bit of restoration work to make it a little bit easier. Cool. Yeah, I've never really thought of, uh, of that kind of work as like resistance, but that's uh, like resistance of flow. Uh, that's really cool. Um, the next question is from Rachel. I've been connecting with nature in my backyard this year more than I've been able to in the past, probably because we're all at home right now. Um, we're making plans to plant milkweed to encourage the monarch butterfly population. I live in Western Massachusetts. Is there anything else in my area that I can uh, plant to help my local wildlife? Ooh, so I'm not super familiar with that area. Um, so I would look into the backyard habitat um, certification program. Even if you don't go through with the certification, um, they will point you towards all of those local resources. Um, and if you have a local like naturalist community or like um, biologist uh, plant folks, um, they would be able to have the resources. It's definitely always good to connect with those people. Um, but milkweed is always a really good place to start in North America. Awesome. The next question is from Josie. Uh, what do you do if you find a snake in your backyard? Uh, well, it really depends. Um, if you're not scared and you're okay with it, um, just watch it. See what it does. Um, see how it moves through your landscape. and See if it's feeding, if it's looking for food, if it's looking for cover, um, just see what it does. Um, if it is a poisonous snake, you know, definitely back away. And if you just leave it alone, it will go off eventually. Sounds good. Um, generally speaking, one thing that we definitely want to say is that if you are looking for animals in your backyard, wild animals are awesome to observe and we like to learn about them, but don't touch them um, because there's a lot of reasons to not touch wild animals, including, of course, the risk of maybe catching rabies or getting other diseases or getting bitten. Um, of course, venomous animals are not something you want to mess with, but also because it kind of just stresses the animals out. Um, and so you don't want to stress out animals 
particularly if you want to watch more animals in your backyard. You don't want to be known as the backyard where people are always getting snatched. So uh, make sure that you don't touch the animals. You just look at them and appreciate them uh, from afar. Um, the next question is from Fiona. What man-made things tend to negatively affect the population of animals the most? So the number one thing would be roads. And, and I think that's true at any scale. Um, my background is originally in more broad scale conservation and looking at conservation patterns on the continental scale. And you can still predict animal movement with highways. You can do it in the city with our small residential roads. Um, so roads are definitely the number one. Um, and it's for a whole bunch of different reasons. First of all, they break up habitat. Um, so they will, um, you know, they'll break up a forest and then you also get these edge effects where it changes the forest. Um, right. So it'll be different closer to the road than it is further away. And maybe some animals don't like that edge habitat. They just, that really stresses them out. And then there's also the threat of cars on the roads and, and roadkill. Yeah, for sure. Um, the next question is, are there any poisonous or venomous snakes in Halifax where you live or any other parts of Canada? Um, there's not in Halifax. I think the only venomous snake in Canada would be the Massasauga rattler, um, which is more in like the Georgian Bay area. And there might be another rattlesnake out west, but I'm not sure. Definitely not here, which is kind of nice because I know I don't have to worry about it when I see a snake. Yeah, that's always good. Uh, the next question is from Bargav, uh, who is seven. Uh, does your research tell people what animals, uh, hold up, uh, really tell people what animals to help or grow? Okay, can, can you, uh, sorry, uh, can you, does your research tell us what uh, animals to help or grow based on the place or city that we live that's more beneficial for where you are? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it, kind of indirectly though. Um, so what I look at is a lot of patterns in how cities are designed and that will tell us um, how animals are using that currently. And we might start to notice that we have small populations of something that might grow over time. Um, so I'm still pretty early in my career, but I can definitely see if we can get like more monitoring going on um, we can start to see those longer term effects of how city design um, can better support animals and start to bring them back. Cool. Um, the next question is, could you share how exactly you did your research? It sounds like you used observations. Did you also use maps? Did you propose locations for wildlife corridors for your city? That question is from Allison. Yeah, so I'm, uh, for my dissertation, I'm still writing the proposal stage. Um, so I can kind of give you the overview of what I'm proposing to do. Um, so in Halifax, we're really lucky that we have something called the Green Network Plan. And the Halifax Regional Municipality is huge. Um, it contains a fairly small urban area and a really large rural area. So the Green Network Plan uh, covers the whole area. And what it does is it looks for really broad corridors of animal movement. And it was done at 100 meter resolution. So any corridor that's smaller than 100 meters wide isn't going to be picked up uh, by this plan. So things like our backyard and our smaller parks within the urban core just aren't a part of this plan. So what I'm planning on doing is building on the Green Network plan um, to look at these finer scale um, corridors that exist within our city and to link up to the larger plan. Um, and so how I plan on doing that is with, um, with maps and with uh, really fine scale imagery. Um, so we're really lucky in Halifax that we have 15 centimeter resolution imagery, which is like Google Maps uh, level of detail. So we'll be able to pick up a lot of things um, with that and build. I'm going to use that um, circuit theory that I was talking about earlier to look at where those corridors are. And then we've also proposed to use iNaturalist uh, data, which is a really fun way that anybody can get involved with science. So it's an app that allows you to share nature observations 
anywhere in the world, whether you're in a city or a state park or a national park or wherever. Um, so you can upload photos of plants, animals, fungus, whatever you see, uh, and people will help you identify them. But what's also really neat is that iNaturalist has made all of that data available to researchers um, so that we can download it and see where people are seeing different animals and plants. Um, so I'm going to plan on using some of that data to see what people are seeing in Halifax and where. Awesome. I'm so glad that you brought up iNaturalist. It's such a cool app. It's a thing that I use all the time uh, when I'm trying to learn about wildlife, either in a new area that I'm visiting or just an animal that I've never seen, particularly insects uh, in, in the Jersey Pine Barrens where I spend some of my free time. Um, all right, the next question came from a couple different people, including um, Emma and Mac and Christina. Uh, I'm going to ask Christina's question, but it rolls in a couple different uh, folks that asked this. My home gets a lot of different animals, especially white-tailed deer and different birds. Sometimes we find baby animals by themselves or birds who hit our window. What can you do to help care for them without directly interfering with them? Yeah, so the first thing I definitely want to reiterate what Sarah was talking about earlier, um, about avoiding touching animals as much as possible. Um, so a lot of the times, especially with deer, it will look like um, the fawn has been left alone or they're hurt. But what deer will do is the mother will hide the fawn and then she'll go off and find food. So sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it's just the mother hiding the fawn. Um, so it might be okay. So definitely keep an eye on it. Um, with deer, I don't really have any advice of how you can help them yourself. Um, I would definitely get in contact with your local, um, if you're in the U.S., Fish and Wildlife, um, or any local animal rescue that can help you out, and they would be able to give you better advice. Great, thanks. Uh, Isabella, a fourth grader, would like to know, um, there's a pond and lake by my house where there are a lot of turtles, geese, and ducks. All the neighborhood kids know about it and they like to feed them. They mostly feed them bread, but I know that bread isn't good for ducks. Would it be a good idea to tell the neighbors that if they're going to feed them, they should feed them lettuce or peas? I wanna send information out in our neighborhood newsletter. Oh, that's awesome, yeah. Um... That's so great that you're getting to see all those kinds of animals on a regular basis too. I wish I had something like that in my neighborhood. Um, but yeah, you're definitely right that bread is not good uh, for ducks. And um, there's really no good nutrients in them for them. And it will also fill up their stomachs so they'll feel full, but they won't really be getting any nutrients so they won't eat what they should be. Um, so yeah, the vegetables are definitely a better thing to feed them. Uh, if you want to feed them at all, but really the best thing to do would be just to watch them and to not feed them at all. That's great advice. Don't feed wild animals. Good advice. Um, except maybe birds and bird feeders. Um, it's actually, I don't even know if that's true. Can, is feeding birds and bird feeders a good idea? It depends on what you put in them. Okay. Um, so seeds, seeds are always the best, uh, the best way to go as opposed to nuts or bread again. Sounds good. The next question is from Denise. What happens if you find a stray cat in your backyard? Oh, I think it froze. Can you hear us? Caitlin? Caitlin, are you there? Uh-oh. Caitlin, can you hear us? Uh-oh, everybody. I think we may or may not have lost Caitlin. I'm not sure. Oh, maybe she'll come back. Oh, good. She's back. Let's see. Sorry. There you Sorry. are. No worries. We understand that okay. uh, the internet is it is. Yeah, okay. it's a rainy, gross day today, and sometimes that makes my internet go in and out. 
totally understand. The next question was, uh, what do we do if we find a stray cat in our backyard? Um, kind of the same thing um, as with any other wild animal. It will probably uh, be fine. If it has a collar on it, it's probably somebody's pet. Um, so you will want to get in contact with them. But otherwise, um, there are a lot of feral cats in cities. It's normal. They're not great for birds. Um, but there isn't really a lot that we can do about it. Some cities do have programs where they um, are dealing with feral cats, where they're either taking them off the street um, to adopt them, or unfortunately some other cities do have more lethal programs. Um, so if your city has something like that, you can get in contact with them, but otherwise just treat them like any other wild animal. Sounds good. The next question is from Charlene. Are there animals underground? Yes. Um, and even in our cities. Um, so there's lots of small mammals that will burrow underground. There's also so things like earthworms um, and even in things like our sewers and our subways, um, there's lots of animals down there. And some of them are even totally unique to those environments. And um, so one thing that's really cool about the London tube and the London subway system is there's a species of mosquito that is found there and nowhere else in the world totally endemic to the London underground and they've done genetic studies where they can tell like how well connected the different um, subway lines are because they're genetically different in different parts of the city it's wild that is wild so okay but the the tube hasn't existed forever so where did those mosquitoes come from so they first noticed them when they were during World War II when they were using them as bunkers during the, uh, the bombings of London. Um, so like people were getting bit while they were down there. And then I don't know if there was just some scientists who were hunkered down and bored and started looking at them. And I don't know, somebody had this question of like, well, are they different than the ones above ground? And it turns out they were. That is wild. That's so cool. Cool. All right, the next question is from Gavin. Is there anything like too much nature in a city where it starts to damage the city or the animals? Um, so from the perspective of the animals, probably not uh, because that's where they're generally happier. But with urban ecology and planning for nature in the city, we also have to think about the human factor. And there are things that we call human wildlife conflicts, which are can be really damaging to people. So for instance, if our deer populations are really high, we're more likely to have accidents, um, with car, car accidents hitting deer, which can be bad for the deer, but it can also be bad for people. So there is kind of finding that balance. And one thing that does really help is our corridor models where we're kind of keeping wildlife away from people, but we're also giving them the space to move throughout the city on their own. So that will help reduce a lot of those conflicts. Cool. And if you're really interested in animal wildlife conflicts, we had a whole session about them back in June. Um, it's all about uh, the title of How People Perceive Nature with Nick Yarmy and Stephen DeFalco. Um, the next question is from Anna. How did you decide that you wanted to do this research? This is so interesting. I'm a senior undergrad bio major in the US. Cool. Um, yeah. So I originally did an undergraduate degree where I focused on conservation planning and my master's research was in more broad scale landscape ecology. Um, but for my PhD, I knew that I kind of wanted to come back to that conservation realm. And I was walking around the city and it was just like, there's so much green space here. And then I was looking at these larger scale conservation maps um, that we have for the continent and the country and cities are just kind of blacked out. And I went into my now advisor's office and sat down with some of these maps and said, why are these blacked out? Like, why don't we include cities? Right. And she just looked at me and said, that's a great question. Want to do a, like, do you want to do research on that question? Um, yeah. Um, so that was one advice that I got in my master's research. Um, so if you're a senior undergrad and you're thinking about oh my goodness, what do I want to research in grad school? One thing to kind of look for is a question that really, really bothers you. And you just really got to find that answer. And that's a, a good place to start. 
solid advice. That's awesome. Uh, the next question is from Ayla and Aven. Is it bad for wildlife if we get rid of a wasp nest in our yard? Hmm, well, it would be bad for the wasps, um, but I'm not sure about other animals because uh, there's not really a lot of things that eat wasps, uh, but wasps will definitely sting other animals. Uh, but again, I would also kind of come back to human wildlife conflict there, and there would be a lot of um, risk having a wasp nest around your home, especially if you've got kids playing around. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is always about that balance between human health and safety and uh, the wildlife. I wouldn't say that we condone risking getting stung, particularly if you have kids in the house, uh, for the sake of the wasps. I think it's okay. No, I think we don't feel too bad about getting rid of wasps nest on our porches, that kind of thing. Um, the next question is from Mark, grade six. What animals are you specifically focused on? And do you have any favorites or any are, that are like the most elusive? Uh, so I'm a really broad uh, ecologist, I focus kind of on everything and more how landscape patterns work. Um, so my research doesn't really focus on any particular animals um, specifically. In terms of what's my favorite and what's the most elusive, I actually saw one for the first time last night um, since moving to Halifax and that was a red fox. I have lived here for six years, haven't seen one in the city yet, uh, but I was waiting for a bus last night and one was like kind of wandering by the bus stop. I got really excited. Fortunately, it didn't have my phone on me, so it wasn't on iNaturalist, but next time. Foxes are super cute. I get super excited when I see foxes too. Um, the next question is from Mackenzie in grade six. Uh, Mackenzie's interested in hummingbirds specifically. What are some things you can do or definitely shouldn't do to attract and support hummingbirds and their migration patterns? That's a great question. Um, so you'll, I'm not sure which hummingbirds you have around you, right. but you can do a little bit of research and see what kind of flowers they really like. Um, so you can try and plant some of those. Um, but with hummingbirds, you can also put out like a nectar feeder um, with some sugar water and that will help them as well. One thing that I know about hummingbirds uh, in terms of having them in your backyard, it's super important to keep those hummingbird feeders clean. You need to be replacing that, that sugar water in the feeder uh, probably more often than you might anticipate because uh, fungus can start growing in those feeders and then um, it makes the hummingbird sick. So if you're going to put a hummingbird uh, sugar water feeder out, that's awesome, but be vigilant and keep it super clean. Um, the next question is from Ian, also in grade six. Ian is an avid birder. He's looking for more ideas on tracking birds in particular. So how do you get close and monitor bird movement? Oh, that's a good question. I love hearing from young birders. You always think about the birder as being like somebody really old, but uh, it's really nice that it's for everybody. Um, in terms of getting closer to birds, yeah, it can be really difficult. Um, sometimes the birds in the city are actually, because they're around people their whole lives, um, it can be easier to get closer to them. Um, so you can try looking at the birds in your neighborhood. Cool. Yeah, again, just kind of trying to let the birds do their own thing. And if you just sit there for a little while, it might come closer to you. Cool. Um, I know that there are some like itty bitty little trackers that they put on birds and often um, they put what's called a band on a bird. And so that band doesn't really track them per se, but when different bird scientists catch them, they mark down, oh, this is bird number 935 or whatever. Um, and so that's how they can kind of keep track of where they've been. Um, and also even like check year to year where the bird has been, which birds come back to certain areas and that kind of thing. Um, the next question is from Talon. Talon wants to know if it's safe to go deep into the woods or will that hurt the animals? Um, so definitely ask your adults and maybe make sure that you have either an adult with you or that somebody knows um, where you are. Um, but really, it's not necessarily going to be harmful for the animals, but you do have to remember that you're in their home. So just like how we 
manage wildlife, human wildlife conflicts in cities, we tend to take the side of the city or of the people. Right. When we're in the woods, we need to remember that we're in their home. So you want to be respectful and not doing a lot of damage to the environment. And if you have a snack with you, make sure that you're taking your garbage with you. Um, Solid advice. So generally speaking, going to the woods is pretty safe for the animals, but make sure it's safe for you as well. Um, the next question is from Ruby and Thomas. Uh, how do we make a bat-friendly habitat in our yard? Oh, that's a good question. And, and it's super important. Oh, there's Aaron. Aaron's um, back. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, bats are super important and they're, um, a lot of their populations are declining or they're endangered um, throughout North America and the world. Um, so yeah, making our, um, our backyards more friendly to bats is super important and a great idea. Um, so you can look into building bat boxes. Uh, so if you just Google it, there's lots of different instructions online and that will give them a safe place to, to roost or to, to lay out for the night. Awesome. The next question is, what's your favorite animal? Ooh, red fox, definitely. Red fox? Yeah. That's great. Um, so when you were younger, what originally got you interested in uh, the career you're in now? Um, so when I was younger, I was definitely that kid who asked questions about everything. Um, so it didn't really surprise my parents at all that I went into research. Um, they had no idea what kind of research I would end up in, but it didn't really surprise them that I ended up in a job where I ask a lot of questions. And my first exposure to science and research-based science was actually in high school, I had the opportunity to participate in the Brock Mentorship Program, which is a program at Brock University that connects local high school students to labs. So you spend half of your day at high school and half of your day at the university working in a lab. And I worked in a lab that was looking at how different landscape factors affect the taste of wine, because um, I grew up in an area that uh, produces a lot of wine. So I was in a lab and doing a lot of like microbiology and pipetting and like wet lab work, which was totally not for me. Um, so much respect to scientists who where that's their jam and that's what they want to do all day, but it's not for me. But what I really fell in love with was this question of how do different landscape structures affect what we take off of it or what we see and how does all of that work? Um, so that's kind of what drove me through undergrad and through grad school is those kinds of questions of really landscape ecology, which is how do different patterns and processes work and how do they fit together? Awesome. Thanks. Uh, the next question uh, is a, a combo between Tupelo and Jackson. First of all, uh, how long have you been researching this topic? and what animals are endangered in New England? And the other question is, uh, what's the most endangered animal in the world? Ooh, those are Our some question. great questions. Um, so I'm now in my third year of my PhD research, um, but I've been doing conservation, kind of landscape ecology research um, for about six years now. And endangered animals in New England. Right whale. Yeah, right whale for sure. Um, I think you guys have cougars. Do they go that far south? Uh, they do go that far south for sure because they're all the way down in Pennsylvania. Right. Um, yeah, I really tested me with the U.S. U.S. biology. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, those, those are definitely the two that come to mind. In terms of the most endangered animal in the world. That's so hard to say, because like, yeah. we might not know. Like there may be an animal in the deep sea that is like on the brink of extinction, but we don't even know it exists, right? So it's really, it's really hard to say, mm -hmm. like to rank most endangered. It's like once you hit a certain level of endangerment, it's a, uh, it's anyone's guess as to who's going to go extinct first, unfortunately. Yeah, and I always think yeah, about all the there. species that went extinct before we even found them. Right. Yeah. So, sad but true. 
Um, all right, so we try to keep these sessions to be about 45 minutes and we always ask everybody the same two questions before we wrap up. The first question is, uh, if you had everyone's attention in the whole world and you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise, what would that be? There is more life and more biodiversity in the city than you think. Um, you just have to look for it. Awesome. That is solid advice. The next, uh, next question is, you still have everybody's attention in the whole world and you can tell them whatever you want about literally anything. It can be as big picture significant or silly and small as you'd like. What would that be? Um, I would want to bring everybody's attention to Nova Scotia and what's going on with our Mi'kmaq fisheries. Um, so the Mi'kmaq are local, in, or the local, the indigenous peoples local to this area um, have started their own fishery, their own lobster fishery, which is their inherent right as affirmed by the treaties and the Marshall decision from the Supreme Court in 1999 and they have been met with nothing but racism and terrorism. Buildings have been burned, vehicles have been burned, fishing gear has been destroyed. Um, so just would want people to see what's happening. That's super important. Thank you for bringing that up. I'm really, I'm really glad that that was what you chose to talk about because that is so important. Um, all right, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, is there anything uh, that you'd like to plug anywhere that we can find you on social media, anything like that? Um, so I am on Twitter, uh, so it's Kate with the C.L. Cunningham is my handle. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. We've learned so much. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for coming back visually. Erin, um, thank I can you. Wave. For, yeah, exactly. Erin, uh, thank you for signing for us. As always, uh, we will see you back here next week. The next session that we'll be having will be on the 28th of October. That's Wednesday at 1 p.m. It's going to be all about lakes. So get all of your freshwater questions ready to go. We will see you on uh, next Wednesday. Uh, thanks again, Caitlin. Thanks again, Erin. And thank you all for joining us today. Bye. Bye.